There's one point that ought to be made right at the beginning. Now, the vehicle with which canonical modern architecture came to the United States after World War II, that is the international style, everything we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, uh, is through Mies. And it certainly is primarily through IIT, which I talked about at such length yesterday. Now, the American architect who picks Mies up most especially in this large-scale program, is Eero Saarinen. Now, Saarinen is the son of Elil Saarinen, the Finnish architect, who did the beautiful entry for the Chicago Tribune competition of 1922. You remember that. And Eero was brought up in uh, America, and he went to Yale, and he went to work with his father. And then uh, he had a, his father died in 50, and he had about 10 years. He died himself in 1961. He had only 10 years in which he did an enormous amount of work, and in which I think you might say he, he incorporated the international style through Mises' work into American corporate life. He created the architecture of one of the most, I, I suppose, powerful elements in American society since World War II, that is the large corporations. And the first big program is for the most important corporation at that time, and that is General Motors. In such a sad commentary on American history then to now, General Motors was the giant then to work for General Motors, to get a good job, to be unionized. It was about the best you could hope for, really, in life. And now, of course, it's, it's a wreck, and it's putting people, sending people away and turning people off. But right then, the General Motors Research Center by Eero Saarinen, which you see on the right, and which is in building in the 1950s. The usual date given is 1955, but he did a, a version of it in the 1940s. Then he came back to it this way in the 50s. And if you look at the plan, you can see that it's really based on Mises' plan. Remember what Gropius did at Harvard with that uh, nervous, twitchy, no space, no volume, active little plan whereas Mies has this marvelous, indeed haunting symmetry, this symmetrical organization, which everybody referred to as, as Renaissance, having us kind of bring, bringing back that sense of the positive urban space, like uh, the, the Piazza dell'Annunziata in Florence, which I talked about last time. Now, the difference between these two, and you can see the similarities here, they're obvious, is the scale. Mies, of course, is pedestrian scale. You meant to see it walking, the streets aren't important, and everything is close, and the spaces aren't very far apart. But Saarinen's General Motors Research Center is, you might say, typical of the America of that moment. It's at the scale of the automobile itself. And this is the scale of that plan. It's enormous distance between objects. And you see them from automobiles. You have to move around by cars from one building to another. And so because of that, the design is much more, how should we put it, flashy, eye-catching than Mies. You never get Mies painting those red uh, walls, for example. All the Mies details, as we've already seen, are ones that you savor, and he works on them, and he's not particularly, he's, he's interested in having glass, but he's really interested in the framework of that glass, the skeleton of that, and how he puts it together, the way the corners come together, and all those things. And you appreciate those as you walk. But here, in the General Motors Research Center, you get really the beginnings of the American screen wall, which grows out of that Bauhaus wall, all glass, forward of the columns, as we already talked about, which Mies uses here at I, more or less at IIT. But here, everything is the you notice the way the structure is subordinated. All you have are the vertical mullions. The rest of it is just as thin as possible. And, and, and it's shiny, and there's a great m mass of it. And you get these long, shiny areas that you approach by automobile and are seen from a great distance. And he has a friend, Gordon Bunshaft of SOM, who we talked about before. He does the Connecticut General Headquarters in your Hartford, Connecticut, exactly the same time, 1955, 1956. And you see how thin he makes his. You don't feel the structure. You don't feel the frame. You don't feel all that articulation, the skeleton that Mies was very interested in. So you just feel that enveloping, thin uh, frame of glass, which is reflective. 
as well as transparent, it has the magic of glass, but all the rest of it is, is subordinated. And, uh, and they're very happy at this time, they say, uh, Saren says, the wall is only two and a half inches thick. It's really great, but then, by the time they do IBM, which is almost the same time in, in uh, the IBM headquarters, they're proud to say the glass is only 5 16th of an inch. And all the architectural magazines say this is the greater architectural triumph. And English critics like Rainer Bannon and so on, who normally had very little to say good about us, as I said, only an American office could do this. Only an American office could have the professionalism of the drawing, putting those elements together to make that wall so thin. And you see, close the door, please. Sorry. And that's what we care about. That's what we seem to care about at that time. IBM also has another quality, which is to stretch that glass to the optimum. The way you come into it is from here, and you park, and you come through like this, and this glass wall is forward of the basically closed spaces behind it, so there's one long continuous corridor like that, which is then stretched with glass like this, which stretches out across the landscape at enormous scale. And it seemed to stretch out across open space. And you really have an image, you had it at uh, Hartford General too, that this is the America of now, we created all that, that, those problems of spreading out across the landscape, of moving all the corporate headquarters out of the centers of cities, out to suburbia and beyond, eating up the landscape, preoccupied with the automobile, preoccupied with technology, preoccupied with corporate power, all of those things. And me and, and Saren really embodies all that. That's why one was, one always felt a little strange, I felt a little strange about his work always. He felt something Tafuri called it uh, corporate advertising, for example. But nevertheless, this is the expression of the American corporation and its values are in it. Now, of course, it really, all that really starts with Mies, but Mies always keeps it to this human scale. He never has a program that big and he wouldn't handle it that way if he had. Remember at the end, and we were talking at the end about Houston, 1958, 59, uh, it's after, really, after IBM, you come to think of it, but he'd already done it earlier for the Deutsche Bank, remember, competition, the curving facade that you get over there finally in IBM, opening out the glass stretched, and here the structure outside, the big steel uh, beams are, 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 are outside the structure, and the wall is outside, and the wall is hung, and the ceiling is hung off them. But again, it's, a, it's an art gallery. Mies sets up the first exhibition, but an exhibition, as you would naturally expect with Mises, as you've already seen, is of sculpture. It's of classical sculpture, Mayol, Lamebrook, the solid figure, the human act, the human presence in architecture, which is space. Sculpture, body, architecture, space, body making the environment, uh, occupying it. Uh, but, but if you compare it with um, Barcelona Pavilion, as you've already seen, the scale has totally changed. There the human figure dominates, basically. The building is small, it's very personal. And this is now really at a corpor corporate scale, vast scale, the scale of the big urban museum. Kind of touching, and when he, when, he, when he lets his sculpture move out into the little plaza in front of it, he really gets, it really gets very, it's mournful. Here he turns to Lamebrook, German sculpture, they look like concentration camp victims. It's really very sad, it's touching. Mies is amazing, you know, Mies, Mies, is, just, Mies is just pure art, as we've seen so far. Sculpture, his body, architecture, space, that's all he cares about, absolutely all he cares about. It's really very beautiful. Now, of course, at the, at the end of his life, that's all he would do is make this one perfect space. And you might say, his ideal finally, he's able to get back to Berlin. He builds the National Gallery in Berlin, right in the last decade of his life, just about 1960. And you see, that's exactly what it is. It's like Crown Hall. It's just one big space up above, which is for changing exhibitions, because there are only eight columns and a great space frame up above it. And it's just a steel construction stretched just as far as it can in order to make a perfect space. And then all the functions are pushed downstairs. 
exactly the way he pushed the engineering school downstairs at, at uh, Crown Hall. And it's kind of touching. I went there purposely to see this, along with other things. Hans Scharoun is, is another great hero. As you know, we talked about him. He survives Hitler, the Boston Nazis. He has a couple of buildings nearby, and they're appalling. They, uh, they somehow are, to me, they are, are absolutely appalling. They're such a mess. And Mies was a disappointment. This was a disappointing building to me. I don't quite, of course, naturally, right away, it was compared to the Altus Museum, to his great model, Schinkel. And Mies would have said, this is exactly what you get. You get now, you have to build according to the technique of your time. That technique is steel. I can do it with four columns in the whole building, rather than so many across the front. And, but it's still the same thing, he would say. Still basically the basic tectonic order of architecture to make the perfect space. And of course, a lot of people at the time would put its column here, which really goes up to just one little pin right there, with the iconic columns of the, of the Aldous Museum. But after all, they really aren't the same. I mean, the ionic column, you can feel that weight. And then the, the, the wonderful volutes of the capital seem to take that weight. On the other hand, it also seems to lift up against the weight, like a jet of water. You can make that, you know, in a canoe with a paddle, not with an oar, because that makes an eccentric, asymmetrical shape in the water, but with a paddle, that's exactly what you get. And you think, and think of Ionia and Thales and those Greek philosophers to whom water was so important. And flood, you can really feel, well, you feel a continuity of Minoan lifeness in it. And it's all body and it's all action. But Mises, is something, it's, it's really tension. And of course, he would study these like a Greek architect. I found him a very moving man, great big, big, heavy man with a great big cigar. And he would sit in front of these. He'd have a full-scale markup in his office in Chicago. And he was pretty old, and he'd sit there with a, with a plaid around his shoulders, and he'd look at it all day. And he'd say, to, to move it a quarter of an inch, move it a little bit that way. It's really wonderful. But you see, they're two different things. I, you really can hardly help but love them both, but they are so different. I mean, that's all tension right up there. You feel it. You don't feel compression down in that thing. It's wonderful the way he makes you feel the You know that would ring. It would ring. It does ring. It. I made it ring. And you hit it. Like there, all his columns ring. Yeah. But then, uh, but they're different. And you say, all right. And me says, oh, you know, almost nothing by nine niches. That's what you really have. Well, is that enough? Some people thought so at the time. Others didn't. But certainly there was a, a movement in the 50s, very strong one to move somehow toward the generosity, the bigness, the weight, the kind of authentic uh, permanence of really classical form. And the whole classic revival, which a lot of you are still involved at the present time, really gets going as a kind of reaction to Mies, just the way Venturi reacted to Mies by saying, less is a bore, as you remember. Now, part of that reaction, more part of it, more hopeful toward it than we thought at the time, but a part of that relaxation is the great Swiss-French architect Le Corbusier, who's without doubt the, the most influential architect of the 20th century. And Corbusier, of course, starts off in La Chaux de Fonds, which is the capital, of, capital of, of the Jura area in Switzerland, French, uh, Calvinist Switzerland there. And he starts off as a Garden City architect. If you know, and then he studies decorative arts. He's interested in decoration. He's interested in the Garden City. And he does some interesting Garden City projects, as you know, which are in Liz and Andres' book, New Civic Art, which nobody had ever, really ever seen before. But he goes in 1910, he makes a trip through the Mediterranean. And he goes especially, and he sees the, the Parthenon and the Acropolis of Athens. And out of that comes when he starts writing in his magazine, Le Spring Nouveau, in 1919, he talks about it, he talks about what he saw there, what he thinks about it. And he puts it all together in that wonderful book I hope you're all reading very carefully, There's an Architecture, 1923, Translators Towards a New Architecture, 1927. And you think about that, and think about it in contrast to Venturi's book, 
1966. You've got a very good exam question right there. And in that, of course, he says the most wonderful things about Greek architecture. Now, doing that, he's following a kind of French tradition, but he's making his own niche in it. That is to say, he loved an architect from Lyon named Tony Garnier, who'd gone to, uh, uh, to Greece on the Prix de Rome from the Beaux-Arts uh, just a little before Corbusier in the early 20th century. And Corbusier doesn't go to the Beaux-Arts. He doesn't have that education, but he goes himself to the Mediterranean. And Tony Garnet just does this painting on the left of the Acropolis. And Corbusier does drawings, some of which I'll show you later. And he says wonderful things about it. He says, uh, the Acropolis, the, the Parthenon, creates a fact as reasonable to our understanding as the fact sea or the fact mountain. And he says something even more than that that I'd never heard any archaeologist say before. He says, the axis of the Acropolis runs from the sea to the mountain. And indeed it does. Where we're standing here on the right, behind us, if we could turn around and look, we would look toward the island of Salamis and the, the bay where the Persian fleet went down uh, in, uh, 470, in 479. And the whole uh, building of the Acropolis that you see up there now is a rebuilding of the destroyed Acropolis, destroyed by the Persians, as a victory, as an image of victory uh, over the Persians. And it's looking right there. The other way, it goes right to the mountain. It goes to Hymettus on the other side, which is the old sacred mountain. And you can see Hymettus there. Hymettus has the typical twin horns and the cones of Aphrodite, who's old Athena, the goddess of the mountain, down underneath. And there was a great statue of Athena Promachos. You've already seen that. I've talked about this before with uh, Burnham's plan for San Francisco, where he uses this in relation to the Twin Peaks in San Francisco. In any event, that's, uh, that's gone. But the old temple here, which was oriented right toward the mountains like this, as was the old palace of the kings, uh, the erected here, was destroyed by the Persians. But the rebuilding is this, and Athena's maid maidens come forth triumphant, and they walk forward across it. And you look up the axis, is the axis of victory, and you turn the other way, look back, and I've already shown you this with San Francisco, you look back, and now the propylia that you come through falls down below eye level, and you see across it to Salamis, where uh, the Persian king sat on the mountainside and watched his ships go down. It's all about victory. That's what, that's what the Acropolis is about. And Corbusier sees that. He senses it. He says it. He says, nothing left but these closely knit and violent elements sounding clear and tragic like brazen trumpets. You know, when you read that when you're young, in 19, right after World War II, say, and you really feel the hackles rise in the back of your neck. There's a really heroic appeal. You feel it. And it's what started me studying Greek temples, actually, was that. And another one that started me was Alvar Alto from Finland, who came and gave talks in America in 1947. He had about 200 words of basic English, and he drew the uh, Parthenon more or less like this on the blackboard. And he says the Parthenon is in a bowl of hills in Attica, and it rises there. And he says, and this was a rebuilding after the Persian Wars. And in the rebuilding of Finland after World War II, we'll build no temporary building because not by temporary building comes Parthenon and Acropolis. The hair gets up the back of my neck. These were heroic people. They really were. I've reacted against that. We all have in the last generation or so. They did a lot of trouble, too. Heroes always make a lot of trouble. It's typical of them. But nevertheless, they were. And Corbusier seemed to embody that that sense of action, that sense of optimism, that sense of fury, really, that's involved. And his drawings are wonderful. See, there he's showing the Acropolis, the, the, the uh, Propylia, the entrance building, sinking down, and you see beyond it to the bay, and you see beyond it to Salamis. And she really shows it. I think the air was clearer when he was there in 1910. It was fairly clear when I was there in the 50s. But if you go back now, it's a black fog of petrodollar smoke. It's really horrible what's, what's happened. You see it. Athens is a good place to see Armageddon preparing between man and nature, the perfect spot, because they always were involved with that in any event. Now, the other thing is, and he did drawings of these, of course, all over. There's, the, there's again, the, uh, this is what the detail is taken from here. And then beyond it, if I had a better picture, 
you'd see the temple of Athena as victory, looking out towards Salamis, with the steps going down below the Propylia, over there. And all that. And he sees Pisa the same way as Tumult, uh, victory, all those things. Now, he, the other thing about him is he sees all that in relation to modern times. And he sees it, he sees the Parthenon in relation to a racing car of 1922. And he says of the Parthenon, something that infuriated archaeology, he said the impression is of polished steel. <laughs> of course it really isn't, but that brings it to life too in another way. Now he also is a kind of early 20th century, late 19th century man. He believes, he believes in progress, thinks art, art can improve, art can get better. So he shows you on the right an early temple of 100 years before the Parthenon uh, in, uh, uh, in Italy. It's, and it's a temple of Hera, and it's got nine columns across the front, and it's got a bulging columns and big caps, and he shows an old automobile, which he says is like that, an automobile of about 1905 on the right. Then he says, now you see what's happened. The automobile has gotten streamed down, neat, taut, to become a standard, and so is the Parthenon. You see, he sees that down to eight columns, very taut, very sharp, the details pulled in, compared with those projecting out in space. The cap's taut like that. And he says, this is, this is the same. People, in other words, you could look at the Parthenon and see modern life. You could look at this and see Greece, which is really a kind of wonderful thing. And then he does, and it's under a, a photograph of a boat, the Empress of Asia, one of those great liners of the 1920s. Not this boat, but one like it, where he has this great de definition of architecture, which you've probably heard a hundred times, where he says, and where everybody was talking about function at that time, I remember everybody was talking about existence, minimum, and all this German stuff going on. He says, l'architecture, c'est le jeu, savant correct et magnifique des formes sous la lumière. Arch architecture is to play, knowing, correct, and magnificent of forms under the light. That is, and, and, and under the picture of a boat. Then, he also does drawings, like the one on the right, and that's in uh, Italy, it's of Hadrian's Villa. And you know, the great thing about Hadrian's Villa that I think maybe I talked to you about before, maybe I didn't, is that as Frank Brown, the American archaeologist, said, it's so sighted under the Apennines as to be the first place from which, if you stand on tiptoe, you can barely not see Rome. You have space out there. And he has this wonderful drawing, tiny drawing, but the velocity of it is enormous along the Philosopher's Walk that looks toward Rome from the big dining hall here of Hadrian's Philip. And out of that comes his first, out of that vision comes his first scheme for a town. Now I'll go back later and talk about his buildings, which really start while he's in La Chaux de Fonds and before he begins to work in this kind of architecture. But I want to talk now first about his urbanism, because that's the thing that, make, that hasn't made the most trouble uh, since that time. I've talked about it already in relation to American redevelopment and so on. But now we'll take it as he developed it, step by step. Now the very first one is this ideal city. Scheme for an ideal city for a couple of million people of 1922. And he got the job, like everything else in France, he happened to know a minister who was involved in an, agri in an architectural exhibition. And the fellow said to him, why don't you design a fountain for us or something like that. Let's have a little art in it. And he said, I'll design you a city. I'll design the whole city. And this is the city. Now, the very heart of the city is supposed to be an airfield surrounded by buildings which are all glass, with airplanes landing and taking off, and with cars roaring underneath right through the city. Now, that's an image, of course, that's of impossible suicidal violence. I mean, you can't have, my God, imagine an airport where you land like that among those glass buildings. Now, what this really shows is the influence on him of the Italian futurists. Now, the Italian futurists are a bunch of intellectuals from northern Italy um, where fascism began. Socialism in Italy came there first, too, and then fascism came there. And there's an artist named Marinetti who wrote the uh, Futurist Manifesto in 1909. And in it, he and his colleagues glorified war and violence in speeding automobiles, in armored trains, and all this. And most of them became fascists later. Most of them fought quite bravely during World War I uh, and uh, became fascists later. And the, the fascists, as we already talked about, you know, bring this sense of aestheticizing politics in terms of action. Mussolini was always having his 
poor fat ministers jump over bayonets and things like that to show that they were tough and could lead the people. It was a glorification of war and violence and male power and so on. And he's got all that there. He's got that crazy thing of those crazy airplanes there among those, among those glass towers. Also, 1922 is, of course, the year that Mussolini marches into Rome. It's the year that fascism starts. And, and fascism, Mussolini describes as a corporate state, be made through the corporations, like this. And Corbusier here calls this a cité d'affaires, a city of business. And he says, only those who can speak the language of the city can live in it. So it's supposed to be a language for a city for businessmen, not for the poor people. We'll see where he puts them later. And so all of that is really quite fascist. There's no doubt about it. And I don't say that Corbusier is a fascist in the sense of Mussolini, but nevertheless, it's that same thing. Of, you see, he's aestheticizing the whole issue. The whole thing is one marvelous aesthetic vision, passionate one, and it's all violent. It has to do with action. And he glorifies an American named Taylor, who wrote about uh, the French called it talorisation, where you show you it's really efficiency, you make people work like machines, the kind of thing that Charlie Chaplin made fun of in modern times. He embraces all that romantically, and he's going to design the whole city himself. Talk about the leader, talk about totalitarian vision. The Duce is, is, uh, is Corbusier. And that city is fascinating. He makes fun of the planning of Louis XIV, but it's a very good indication he looked at it very hard. And you see what it is, it really looks a lot like Washington. It has the radiant avenues that we're used to from the note on, and it has what he calls the Jardin Anglais, the English garden here, and that's like the mall in Washington. And it looks like a typical grid plan. And, on, and what it really is, is a kind of history of architecture, or the, what he sees as the liberation of architecture, moving from the outside in. Now the way he does it is this, he has on the outside, he has these tight grids, and they have buildings which are rectangles, which are in fact like, uh, they're, like uh, they're like the quadrangles of the uh, housing in Amsterdam that we already talked about, of this very period, a few years before. And they're out here. And you notice how it's like a wall around the city. And as you progressively go in, he progressively opens it up. So you come in here and he has what really amounts to Versailles, two rooms deep, in a garden, and he calls them buildings at, at, of setbacks, like this. They go through a garden, so it goes from the quadrangle of the grid city to a garden with Versailles in it, to now the freestanding cross-axis skyscrapers in the middle, with the landing field in the middle. And you know, this is a lot like the plan of Coral Gables, as it finally worked out. If you live in one of the little houses, in the tight little blocks, they're all around the edges. They hold it. Then as you move in, it progressively gets more open around the golf courses and around the university. You get this fluid interior of it. But the outside holds tight with the grid. It's really fascinating. You see that. And that's what he's got. That's what he's got there. So you go first from that, and we'll see him designing for that first. Then you go to these. Oh, and I want to point out Tony Garnier went back to Lyon after he'd had his pre de Rome. And he spent most of his life there, the way French architects used to do. And like Corbusier, who's all over the world, of course. And he does an ideal city, but it's, it's much more sort of realistic. You see, Corbusier has no idea what's the function here. He doesn't have any idea if there's going to be any industry, what's the housing, what that's going to be like. Are they office buildings? Are they housing? How does it connect with anything? It's nothing, none of that. He's, he's above all that. It's, it's aesthetic. And it's a very good example why the new urbanism is so important. Because one person can't do it all. You cannot. And, and, and the modernists are still trying, trying to do that. They come out every day and they design a new urbanism. Sorokin designs a new urbanism. It's mad. You can't. The only you get, the only you can get is a vision of hell because it's one, one man's vision is too too impatient, too limited for the whole. Anyway, Tony Garnet works it all out and he has logical housing and grids and central squares and, and industry and transportation. He really works it out and nobody pays any attention much. But Corbusier seizes the imagination. You see, it seizes it right away. Imagine you're a young architect as you, you are and somebody comes along and says, you can remake the world. Never mind those guys. I don't know what those old guys tell you. Look, oh, this is what we'll do. Let's we'll throw them out. And that's what happened, we'll see, in South America. Remember when he took his famous trip there in 36. But see, then you get 
Versailles, or the Mansu, to the middle. And then in the middle, finally, you get this, this image, which you've seen before. And of course, the French resisted until uh, very recently. But in America, it's what makes redevelopment. You've seen that already in New Haven. The connector is that image right there. And then he goes on, he develops it further. For example, in 1925, he has his so-called voisin plan for Paris, right in the heart of Paris, right uh, 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 north of the river, right near the Ile de la Cité, not far from Notre Dame. And he shows you first, here's the old neighborhoods, and he says, how, in, how depressing they are. They're narrow, and they cut off the light, and you have to look at other people, and that's depressing. What you want is airspace and light, and this superhighway comes rushing through. Then you get his setbacks come out like a tiger stroke here, and lays that waste with that. And then finally they culminate again in this great cross axial skull, skyscrapers in what he calls English gardens, super blocks, like this. And that's the old world he's going to destroy. Remember him talks about this. And this, of course, set the type of planning that ruined us all in the 50s and 60s. We've already talked about that in detail. Uh, Tom Beebe, it's interesting, wrote a very interesting article in which he pointed out that these shapes derived from little patterns, decorative patterns for wallpaper the Corbusier designed along around 1911, 1912, 1913, right through there, when he worked in decorative arts. It's got nothing to do with any kind of function. I mean, he has no idea what it's going to be for. Couldn't care less about the whole thing. And then you get, so you get this great image. We already talked about this great collective image. And then you get the leader, you see. He, 1925, you get the leader. Here's Mussolini and eventually Hitler and Speer, I suppose, for Speer. There's the hand of the leader. He organizes the whole world like this. And then there it is, and it gets you at that great collective image, that somber collective image we talked about before. It's great drawing from his office where they all go up into the mist. Really great. A terrifying vision if you think about it. You know, even more terrifying things are being proposed by people today. I don't know if you surf the net the way my wife does all the time, but you, you ought to see the proposals of Foster for Vancouver. Have you seen those? Or the proposals of a group which calls itself properly mad from Shanghai. Have you seen the work in Shanghai? They're proposing something for somewhere else. Which, and they're unbelievable. And yet people are mad for it. I mean, it's that hunger of a consumer society for shapes, shapes. All they don't want is they don't want them to seem to mean anything. They just knew that's all. They're just shapes. Fascinating, really. And Corbusier, of course, in a way, is bolder than any of them. Look at that. Talk about Zaha Hadid and all their kid stuff compared to this. That vision that's there. He's, he's partly responsible. So is Mies. Remember, those early projects. And he says what all of you who are involved in the urbanism knows not to be true. He says it doesn't matter what the rest of it is like. These few big buildings make Paris. This is what Gary counts on now. This is Bilbao. This is what these cities are all banking on, that one big building will save them from bankruptcy, and so on. And he says, he says, you see, originally it was just Notre Dame, right? And then uh, the route to Spain here with the Saint-Germain there, and that was Paris. Then comes the Rosselet, Louis XIV, and you have uh, the Louvre, and and then you go on a little later and you have probably the Invalide, I suppose that is, and that's still Paris. And then, of course, in the 19th century, you get the Eiffel Tower, and so on, and you get the Pantheon rising up there on the hill, and you get Sacre Coeur, and that's still Paris. And then he says, he shows these in that landscape, and he says, c'est encore Paris. It's still Paris. But of course, it's not. Now, then he goes after what you might call the, the normal living areas. Here is just destruction. And what he proposes is this. And again, he uses now, not, not high rises like this, but medium rise, as you saw, not much higher than Versailles, his setbacks. And he's going to put them in a garden, and he shows you how all this stuff is not as good. This is going to take care of everything, no matter how you did it before, Amsterdam, South, or wherever, however you did it in New York, he said, however you did it before, this is the way you're going to do it now. And it's clear, you see, it's like Stuttgart. And he may well have been influenced by Ernst Mai, for example, at, uh, at, 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 uh, at, at Frankfurt, I'm sorry. Where, you see, you have, remember I've shown you this already, 
you start with the bad, it gets a little better, it's even better here. Better here at all when there's no orientation at all, and it's open on both sides, and they're just slabs. But Corbusier's vision, you have to say, is not a terrifying, terrifying German vision of Hilbersheimer here, out of that. Here's the slab, triumphant. But the things that are coming out in the papers now really are really even worse than this, you know? This is not past, it's not past at all. And Corbusier's is really this vision. Huh. There was a French movie about this time called Anou la Liberté, where it's about the workmen, and now this new world, this utopia world, machines will do all the work, and everybody else will go on vacation. They go on what they call picnic, they go picnic, and they come rushing out here, and they're in a world like this, all glass, and uh, garden, and you're free, and there are no automobiles to bother you, and it's paradise. It's the skyscraper in the English garden. And it's going to be, and that's his vision, which is, but it doesn't work. For example, the closest thing that was ever built to that is this housing that we all loved in England shortly after the war in Richmond Park in London called Roehampton. And they put Corbusier skyscrapers, later type of Corbusier building, but nevertheless, they put Corbusier buildings on the piloty and so on in an English garden. Like that. And they looked lovely until people began to live in them. And then all the sociological reports kept coming in. Drunkenness, crime, unemployment, because they'd lost their pubs, they lost their streets, they lost their places, they lost their neighborhoods, they lost everything that gave their lives structure, especially for the young, everything went to hell. You just can't do it. You can't engineer life that, that abstractly even though the vision is humane, it's a lovely vision. The other thing that's involved with it, of course, is the automobile. And he's gonna separate that from the ground. And that sounds wonderful. You make the pedestrian different, and you keep the automobiles away, but then that's part of that separation of functions through zoning, which are really so much when they're together and discipline each other, and we've seen that happen over and over again. But he shows you what's gonna happen, the garden and the new kinds of skyscrapers and the road system. Then, by 1930, he gets preoccupied with this road. That road is going to be the new city. And now you're going to have a new kind of city, not the Cité d'Affaires, but the linear city. And that linear city is going to be made up of three, of four methods. It's got four routes, the four routes. The four routes of, of communication. One is canals, which we don't, never think of in the United States, but they're a wonderful system in France still. And if you read Simeno on those things, you want to know how important the canal is. Then the railroad, then the automobile, then the airline. And everything is going to stretch out along that kind of industrial park of all kind of housing, in industry, and so on. And you'll have a linear system. And of course, th that's developed in various smaller scale ways, like Route 128 around Boston and around most cities. There is a kind of linear city that has developed. And Corbusier now is going to design all of Europe on this pattern. And eventually, <laughs> the whole world. And he says, you see, you'll have la ville concentrique, the, linear, the uh, cité d'affaires, which is uh, where the businessmen are going to be. Then you have the industrial city, which is going to be like this, go to another cité d'affaires. And that's where industry is going to be in most of the housing. That's where the people who are good enough to work on factories but not good enough to work in the Cité d'Affaires, that's where they're going to be. Then in between, and when you see this in France, you know that means sheep shit to your knees and rubber boots sinking into the mire, you're going to have the uh, Reserve Paysan. That's where the peasants are going to be working in there. There's the world. Now, there's a fascist vision, if there ever was one, or a totalitarian vision, call it whatever you like. And it, but, I mean, it's, he doesn't mean any harm, but he, he's, he's driven to design the whole world. It's frightening, really. It's touching. And he, he, and he does wonderful things like this one. This is for Algiers, just before the Second World War, about 1939. As I understand it correctly, he comes from Algiers to a suburban site. And then he has this long sort of building, which has the road on the top, and then all the floors underneath it. A mad vision, that's what, going across. And you have the sea out there, the Mediterranean. You get up there and then you have all the 
this like a segments of this road, like a like a snake been cut and, and, and absolutely uh, drowning the old town right here in these. And he has he has buildings that are supposed to be free of the structure, so you can do anything. There are people you see that have cars parked here and cars are going on up above, and it's this vast distance. And you and it's touching that it looks a lot like some of his drawings of Hadrian's Villa again. Again, you're looking down that philosopher's walk. You have that velocity, that distance, wonderful sense of space that he gets in those little drawings. But it's a mad vision. And then, as I said earlier, he goes to South America, makes his famous trip in 1936. Uh, Jean-Paul Lejeune has talked about this and written about it. He goes to these towns like Rio de Janeiro, the students riot, they throw out their professors, they throw out these very good teachers, these urbanists, these people who really know something about work on their lives, they don't want anything to do with them, they carry them around on their shoulders. It's the revolutionary vision of violence and simplicity. You can do it. And he's coming in, but what a wonderful drawing, crazy drawing. He's coming in on the plane, he sees Sugarloaf, he sees the topography of Rio, and right away, he says with this godlike vision, he says what's wrong with Rio is that these things come in Divide it, so you really want to connect it with one of those, like that. Yeah, so right away he does this thing coming across like this. And then it's really great. It's as if the plane banks. It's another wonderful drawing. It's so quick. The plane is banking. See? It's going to land, if it's lucky. And there's Sugarloaf, and there's what he's going to do. And it's so irresponsible but it's so uh, seductive. And, you know, it's like somebody blowing a bugle. It was for the young people at that time. It was for everybody. Remember, we'd forgotten what a city was all about. I mean, depression and war, by the time World War II came along, was when I was subjected to these things, he, here's Montevideo, look at Montevideo, whack! It's gone. Or Sao Paulo, right angle. There's Sao Paulo. It's, yeah. Well, that's the urban vision, and we've talked about it enough, but it's important. It's the one that's really, has really almost created everything up till now, and it's still going on in the magazines and, and in, the, in the public eye and so on. But now, where he comes from, of course, is La Chaux de Fonds, here. And there's a painting of about 1840. And it's the highest provincial capital in Europe. It's up in the Jura, not far from the French border. Very cold, remote. It's, uh, Stern, Swiss, French, uh, Calvinist landscape. And he, as I say, he's a garden city man there and he does garden city projects, which aren't very different than that. And starting about the time of World War I, 1914 or so, he does houses like this, which would fit perfectly well in the garden city or in the outskirts of Vienna, say at that time, or the outskirts of Chicago. Looks a little like Frank Lloyd Wright, looks a little like Voicey. You can see he's right in that late vernacular style and could fit right in there. Then in 1915 and 16, he does one which is much more abstract. It's the Villa Schwab, uh, S-C-H-W-O-B. And you can see what it is. It's a strange building. It's, very, it's weird. It's this flat open space in the middle, two oval windows on both sides like this, uh, engaged like columns, piers in the wall, valley columns out here, uh, big things that look a little like Wagner or somebody back there. We feel a little Vienna in it. It's a very strange building. But I think his model is uh, Lutyens. Remember, he's the one that said he always kept Lutyens around. Both he and Wright said almost the same thing. They always had a copy of Lutyens to look at. So, so remember Heathcote. I'm sorry, see, you have a center which is basically pulled apart in a void. And on the sides you have these oval windows. You see them here. Then you have these columns which are engaged in the wall. And then you have these windows which are back there in cross axis. So you've got all that here. I think he took, takes the luchins and abstracts it, abstracts it further. And it's maybe the most awkward villa one could imagine. Look at it here, it's on the street. Look at it from the side. It's really weird, there, there it is on the street. I mean, so, it seems inept, really. And it's a very odd plan. You see that part of the street seems to be one big, great big, I suppose, kitchen. And this seems to be a great big 
Well, maybe this is the kitchen. I, I don't really know what those are. It looks like a big dining. There's a dining area here. Maybe that's the kitchen. I don't know. But then you come into the major space, which is typical of all the spaces he makes later, two-story high on this side with a wall of glass, going back to an upper level, which comes forward in a, in a sort of balcony uh, over the thing. So that you, uh, you have this. You have, just, remember, just totally the opposite of Mies, or right, very really high space. He says later that he gets this from a cafe that he was in in Paris. But it's not that. He's, he's doing it long before he goes up and works in Paris. It's that somehow he wants that high volume. That's what he's after. I think it's more challenging. He wants the two story. And then you look back the other way. You see, you look back, you get these very plastic forms. Move, very sculptural forms moving back in the upper level and back on the other side. Now, in 19, I think it's 1919, but he may go earlier, he goes to Paris and he starts to paint. And when he starts to paint, he uh, works with a, a, a French painter named Ozenfant. And they have a, a movement which they call purism. And they want to purify France. There have been a couple of good books about this. When France, during World War I, had a lot of soul searching. They felt they weren't tough enough to stand up to the Germans. They had to get tougher. They had to clean up their act. It's too bad. It's kind of a puritanical reaction. And you take cubism, which is kind of messy and wonderfully chaotic and tumultuous as it were, and clean it up and clarify it, purify it. It's a puritanical movement, and that's what he sees himself doing. Now, it's interesting what these paintings are like. This is one of 1922. He says he does the first one about 1919. It's of a white cube. Uh, you see, you have, first of all, you have very flat shapes. Then you have very plastic shapes, exaggeratedly plastic. And you have very recognizable objects. They're all there, especially the great French bottle of wine. It's like this. And it doesn't move toward abstraction. It's clear in the objects, the objects of daily use, but they have a curious duality of thinness, no profile at all, just thin, but then very heavily, primitively, plastic like this. Now, you know, you can't ascribe the forms that artists make to physical peculiarities but it did, a curious thing did happen to him in 1919. And he said he did it working on his first painting. He said he worked so hard on the painting that he detached the retina of his left eye, therefore became mononuclear instead of binuclear with two eyes. Now, I've been told you can't do it that way, but you can detach the retina. Today it can be fixed back, but the operation to do that didn't exist until 1926. So when this happened to him earlier, he couldn't be fixed, and he remained blind in his left eye all, his, all the rest of his life. And he used to, when he used to play basketball with his people from his office, a vast anchor to say he would wear a little, would wear a little uh, thing over his good eye, you know, over his right eye. But the other one was always gone, you know, the wonderful black glasses and so on. And, that, and there's that Corbusier image of himself, this lean, driven intellectual, half blind, with these great visions and painting and, and monocular vision. Remember, the basic, uh, the basic the style image that we saw, this painting of a house by uh, Van Duisburg and Van Estrin, remember I talked about? That kind of uh, 30, 60, that uh, is monocular as against the perspective, which is binocular. That's one reason Wright never drew these, ever. Everything is flattened, like a cubist painting. We saw that before. And it is binocular. Nothing has any weight. Nothing has any plastic. Now, the, the binocular vision has a lot of wonderful things in it. For example, uh, everybody, nobody needs two eyes, except uh, the eye doctors will say only eye surgeons need two eyes. Everybody else can get along with one. Largely because you see with your mind, you think. But if you don't have time to think, strange things can happen. If you're in a restaurant, for example, and you're not thinking, you're talking to somebody, the waiter offers you the menu, you might miss it. Very likely you will miss it. But sometimes you get to a head of a flight of stairs, and all of a sudden the stairs flatten out below you. Or all of a sudden the wall is close, because you weren't looking, weren't thinking. It's fascinating, and he exploits all those things. He exploits them all. He really does. Now, whether 
because of this, whether in spite of it, whether suggested by it, or part of his sense of tumult. But first of all, he is the artist. And his partner, Ozonfon, here, he builds a, a studio, a little house studio for Ozonfon here in 1922. And this is the uh, uh, studio, and it's high up in the top. And he has a tiny little fireplace here. And he has the libraries up there, the rounded shape. Notice how it's like that rounded shape there. Well, the rest of it is absolutely thin, linear, around it. And you go up to it by this sort of ship's ladder, like this. And you get all that glass. And you're, in, you're an artist. And you're in a studio. It's like a factory. And it's tough, and it's a place to act. It's a place to work. It's a place where the artist makes the world. That's the way they see it. Not for a family like Franklin Wright. Not to smooth people out and so on. Not to make this absolute quiet like Mies at all. But to make two more action. And this wonderful jagged. That building is still there. And it, you know, it doesn't do much harm on the street because it's a funny little street. There's a lot of little French pignon anyway. It's taking a little Gothic revival pignon. It, it looks all right. This international style this time doesn't do much harm to the environment. It's the urbanism that does harm to the environment, not the individual building, basically, as we'll see. And you're there, and then you look the other way, and you see it's a place to work, and there's that exciting ladder and so on. And then the furniture, I mean, how different from Mies. Instead of those great thrones, those noble Greek thrones, he has these, what he calls thone, should be tonnet, I guess, because he's Prussian, chairs, which are cheap, and you get from the store. And he says, they're wonderful, they carry he says that they carry patents of nobility in their knapsack because they look like wonderful Queen Anne chairs or something like that, Bentonwood. But you throw them around, they're cheap, you use them. See them in both places. The rest of the furniture is tables and so on. And uh, you contrast it. There's Mies with a calm. He likes the ceiling quite low. And there are the thrones for the King and Queen of Spain. And there's a beautiful image of the, of the sculpture uh, making the environment mysteriously, back there. And all this is just, you are the sculptor in Corbusier. You're the one that acts. And it's also like a machine on a career. Maison habite like a machine on a career, like a typewriter, a machine to live in, to live in it, and it means action, to, move, to live actively in it. The greatest difference is with Wright. Remember with Wright, we talked about the relation to Freud. We talked about how Freud said he had to inter unweave the strands of the nuclear family, in order to, of the, of the uh, family romance, he called it, to find out what was wrong with the children that came out of it. But Wright is going the other way, as you know. He's weaving together calm, but stability, weight, integration, father, mother. He's trying to weave a marriage where you feel that children can be brought up with stability, but with a sense of freedom and all that. And he bases on Freud. Now he, Corbusier here, seems to reflect a, a movement in psychiatry that comes along later, and it's largely French, as you can imagine. And it's carried by two people called Deleuze and Gattari. And they write a book called The anti Edip, The Anti-Oedipus. And they throw out Freud, and they embrace Marx. The children will be brought up in a state, not by family, so there'll be no more father and mother. You won't have the problems you get from fathers and mothers. And, and Nietzsche, action, will to power, all that which Nietzsche sees, which Corbusier, believe me, embodies himself, that will to power here. And that's what you get here. Look at this. This is all ironic. This is for young men. This is for violent, impatient, active young men. Not to make families. Not for children. Just the opposite. Say, Auntie Edip, it really is. And it, therefore, it's very, very late 20th century, even though here it's only in 1922. And he does another one the same year. 1922 is a big year for him. He does a house that he calls a Maison de Tonneur, a house of thunder. And he, he does it for an auteur in the Rue de Docteur Blanche, Maison La Roche, he calls it. And here you're in the, living, the, the basic hall, I guess you'd call it the basic living room of the house. It's now the Institut Le Corbusier, so you can visit it any time. And the light comes down from above. And the stairway goes up and comes out into the space, goes back, there's a bridge going across in front of the light, goes up to another level where it's very low, look how low that ceiling is. And the whole thing is the thunder of movement, tumult, action, just the opposite of Mies, just the opposite of right. And 
it again is Lutchens. I mean, remember uh, Little Thakum, I'm sorry. Wall of glass, wall of glass, right? You come in and here, there are two doors like those. These are heavily rusticated and they go up to an upper level which is squeezed in scale. I mean, you really can hardly stand up. It squeezes it. Well, that's what happens here. When you go up there in the Anselm Corbusier today, if you're sort of moderate size, you can't stand straight. You have to go like this. And so almost maybe it's as if I deceived him. Or he wants to pressure you, whatever. Or he doesn't care that it's not enough for him. But there isn't. It's fascinating. I mean, all of it is too much. And unlike me, say, he doesn't really care how it's built. Not really. He talks about it later as being systematic, but it's not typical rubble. Concrete, though, is very important. Slab, the beam, and so on. But he paints it to look thin. It looks as if there's no way. This is heavy, massive construction, but it comes out looking like paper. That's what he wants. He wants it thin. And I'm sorry I don't have color here, because he uses color, too, as you know. Very strident. And you see, you look out, there's that window. And uh, there's the house next to it going on. Here's a gallery that comes out toward you. And you've got another house over there. So what you've got is something that looks very primitive out there. There's just a shell around that tumult that's going on inside. It's as if like a child drawing it. I mean, you know when you first start to draw, you start to draw buildings and you find you're only drawing lines. You're not drawing depth. You're not drawing the shape. That's what you learn to do. It's like a child drawing. And somehow it's, I mean, it's absolutely primitive. Just, just well, what this represents is this first stage where he's just moving out in all directions. Later, you'll see, he says he must have bring it back into a square. Bring all that back into a frame so he can read it. That's what he does at the Villa Savoie. We'll talk about that later. That same year, Vaucresson, in 22, does this villa in Vaucresson, which is very conservative compared to the uh, Maison La Roche, as you can see, and which later fell into the hands of somebody who did this to it. It's really sad, I suppose. But, the, but you can see, you see that window drawn that way, built that way, leaked, obviously. So they had to put in, they wanted to put in a little like that, like that. And the roof must have leaked like mad. He put another roof on it. Then unfortunately, they wanted a store in front. That's not Corbusier's fault. But it's a good example of the way uh, it's buildings for the intellectual. It's building for the, those who are excited as he is about this form. And he has a wonderful time with it. They have a marvelous time. Now, he, for example, in 22 also, he says, I must build housing. Everybody builds housing. And he starts with the Amsterdam type, with the quadrangle. But look what you've got. It's not like Kramer or the clerk or somebody with tiny little apartments inside with great uh, communal uh, action and spaces and fortified at the corners and saying, us. Not every one of those is an enormously elaborate villa with a hanging garden. And the luxury of it is enormous. Each one has an outdoor garden like the hanging gardens of Babylon that a two-story living room and two stories behind it there, like this. And uh, you can see it in plan. It's wonderful fun where you, each one has a little balcony in front, has a living room, you know, kitchen back here. You'll hold to come down to light through here, uh, outdoor garden up here, like this. Then he gets a chance to build it. And at the uh, Exposition des Arts Décoratifs, in 1925, where all the forms are very different from this, he managed to get this, which he calls the Pavilion of the New Spirit, the Pavillon de l'Esprit Nouveau, gets to build it. And in his typical way, he grumbles and grumbles because they won't let him cut the trees down. So he has to cut a hole in the roof. He's going to have a hole there anyway, but he got a hole in the truck for the tree. But I think he enjoyed doing that, in fact. But now let's see, there's the whole thing. There's the two-story living room. There's the Trois Jardins outside. And you can see, if you get back in there and look back toward the front, there again is that two-story wall. See how high it is. All the luxury is in the height. It's very narrow this way. Everything is challenging, not relaxing. It's got you in a box and you're going to act in it. And you look to the right into the thing, or, or you look in the other direction, from the window at your back, down toward the kitchens and so on there. And you see the way he uses a little piece of Cuba sculpture by Lipchitz, not the way Mies would use it, not as a, not as a stable sculptural mass from which the, the space is empathetically expanding, but acting too. 
like the space, and he buys these in the, uh, in, you know, in, in, in the uh, magazine, the girl magazine, just comes right out of the store. He's got his stone eight chairs. And back there, it's so typical, it's really wonderful. He's got his idea of a staircase. And of course, this house, I should have shown you in the plan before. See, he's got great big, great big bathrooms where you also work out. And he has these drawings of these people punching the bag. And it's very English in his point of view. Little French kids at this time, of course, got no exercise. They worked in the lease all the time with bags under their eyes. He wants to be different. Wants, this is fascist too. This is like Pétain later. Get out in the country, hike around, get, get tough, get big. The French are big. They're frighteningly big now. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. And uh, that's what he wants. There it is. And if you want to talk about, you know, about the iconography of a staircase, here's one in a house by Perret. Now, Perret yeah. is a man who really worked all his life on how to build concrete correctly. And he did. And he had, his, he had his people who backed him. But on the whole, never created that excitement that Corbusier did. Never. And here's a staircase by Perret. And you can see why. I mean, look at that. Everything about there says vitality, youth, life. Jump over the bayonets, right? Violence, fascism, whatever. And here you can see some old French senator with an enormous tummy and a bad liver. He's feeling his way down the stairs. He holds on this, he tries to, and he stumbles over this. I mean, what a stairway. What a really horrible stairway. So inert. Look at this one, it's just really wonderful. Now he wants the whole house to be that way. If he can get that way, he'd like the whole building to take on that quality of action. And he, he does it by certainly 1927, at the Weissenhof exhibition, as you know, that year. Now, this is the house he proposed, and you see it stands on stilts, on his piloti, and it's thin and light, and it looks active, it challenges the world. It's hollow, but nevertheless, it's, that box is lifted, so it's like, a, it's like a creature, as much as you can make a little box be. And you know that exhibition has had more? Oh yes, now he gets to that, by a sequence where you can see how he tries to get it. Again, in 1922, he takes that plan of his and he tries to make it into a house and it's like a little megaron, just dumped on the ground, solid behind, open on the front. It really is like a Mycenaean megaron from that. An English critic once said that I had megaromania because I said that, but no, it is, it is a little bit like that. Then he wants it to lift it, doesn't want it to be dumped on the ground like that. So right away he does this. A seaside villa, thing. it's got a little pilote yacht under it. Then finally in Stuttgart he gets it the way he wants it. Tall pilote, really lifting there in space. Now Weissenhof, of course, has had more written about it than all that wonderfully important housing in Amsterdam and Vienna that we talked about before. And it's really only a little exhibition neighborhood. It's hardly really, it's not really a community in that sense at all, but it has a big slab by Mies and buildings by Gropius and others. And Corbusier, and it's Corbusier who stole the show. Here's that one you see here. Here's another one here, which is a really fascinating one. That's like a railroad car, double house, all one space, tiny uh, car in the back there. This space, uh, flexible for night or day, up on thin PLT like this, taut, stretched. And the two of them really just jump out like this. And they really are, again, Greek in that sense. The way an archaic Greek temple is active, like the temple of Athena at Pestum, which has no, never had a horizontal cornice like this, where the em emphasis on the emphasis is high, and it's narrow, and it lifts. And that lifts too. But it's space, it's a volume, it's a box. Because the temple is a body, but nevertheless, this is much like a body you can get. And the space inside is great fun. You see you come in there and you come up to that main level, which is two stories high, right there. And above there is this uh, boudoir, which looks that, down across the space. You go up and you have, on the very top floor, they don't show it here, you've got two guest rooms that look out on the Trois Chardins. And if you sit at that little desk right here, it, uh, you look out at the heating pipes that come up through the middle painted bright colors, full space going down, it's all delightful. Now, he said what all that was about actually two years before this, in 1925, in a house for an American newspaper man named Cook. So it's the Maison Cook 
at Boulogne-sur-Seine, just beyond the Bois de Boulogne, Boulogne-sur-Seine. And here he has what he's going to have, what he calls the five points. All architecture from now on is going to have five points. And the points are these. The first one is the piloti. And he shows you in what he calls this uh, domino construction, but which really had been doing by Perre and by Gropius and everybody for a long time, where the columns are separate, so everything else, mis to, everything else can be non-bearing. Which means if you have the piloti, then you have plan libre. You can do anything you like. That's the second point. PLT first, free plan, plan libre second. Then with the free plan and with the uh, cantilevering of the slab beyond the columns, you have facade libre. It's not bearing, so you can do anything you like. Then you have something that philosophically falls out of the, but which is part, because it's part of the facade, you have the finette I shall men, the window at human scale, which goes across like that. And then you have the trois jardins, which is the fifth, which is the fifth point. They have piloti, plan libre, facade libre, window at human scale, roof garden, all at once. And you have a great time. I happen to see this with Hitchcock, who wrote, of course, really the great book about the international style uh, uh, in 1932 with Johnson. And he, he saw this, this was late, this was maybe about 1940, 1952 or so, and it had been painted pink. And he had a complete revulsion. He said, who can, before an architect, architecture can be ruined by a coat of paint? Well, it didn't seem to me an important point because you could just paint it white again and it's all over. But nevertheless, it is all surface. That's the thing I suppose he meant. But the fun is wonderful. Somebody asked Cook how he liked the house and he said, he said, uh, it doesn't make any sense, but it's very original. C'est pas pratique, mais c'est original. It's really great. You have tiny, you come in, you have tiny little stairs, come up like that. Look what you can do with the plan leave. You have a room like this, whoop. You enclose the back of the thing like this. Then you have this wonderful shape. You have a fireplace maybe there. You have all this and then you, you squeeze the maid a little bit, unfortunately, like this. Make it bigger for this chamber like that. And then you go up another level and you see that's all back up in here. Then you go up another level up to here and above you, you have that wall coming in on you like that, going up to the Trois Jardins, which is over there on the right, with a diagonal thing that goes up through a study to it. So you're in a room there. It's like being inside one of his paintings. Really wonderful. See that wall comes back in over your head. This thing, talk about tumult. You talk about the fireplace. Remember the way the fireplace for right is this shrine, it's this sacred fire burning heart. With Corbusier, it's a little ironic, little thing off to one side. You suck it like this. Always pushed awkwardly somewhere. Because, but then this one will have the light up there high, only the door here, so the flood is above you. Like that. Looking out to the garden. And then going up, and you look out in the Bois de Boulogne on the other side. Or if you get in your little car, your traction avant automobile, and you go out the other side of Paris to a town called Garche, then you see a building that almost isn't there. By the way, this is the way automobiles were, and it's really wonderful. Instead of sticking out like that, the way they do now, I don't know why. The wheels are out there, the thing is way back, you feel like active, it comes in like that. And there's the house, and you see the house is almost not there, because there he achieves that obsessive European desire that goes back to uh, Neoplatonism and to uh, Vitruvius, uh, where the, uh, if you have mass, you cannot have real beauty. Real beauty can reside only in drawing, because only that can be perfect, because it's not involved with vulgar matter. So the gardens solve it by having not the building, but the surface of the ground, which is treated like as thin as a sheet of parchment, straight, right? We talked about before, and that's what he does there. With his factory sash and his white walls and his no details, where's the corner? It's just not there, it's just drawing. Pure, pure drawing, it's fascinating. And, uh, and it's this, of course, that we talked about, that beauty can only be draw in drawing, design like this. Therefore, the human body is sculptural, but the perfect shapes of the circle and the square in which it fits are as tight drawn as piano wire. And that's what he gets there. And it's curious that poor old Perry, at the same time, 
who really knows how to build in concrete so it lasts. That won't last, of course. That's the water. We've seen what happens. The water gets in. You have to work on it like a dog. It's worth it, but never what you do. Here's the way Perre builds with concrete. He's got protection against the water. He has strong, solid uh, frame. He's got very bizarre, very classic frame, going back to uh, Mossad. It's in Garsh at the same time. Nobody ever cared about it. Like this. But there, it's captured the imagination, especially in space. If you go in there up to the second level, this is all open down below. There's a stair coming up. There's a ramp coming up. Come out like this. He really has a column there, but he never draws it because he doesn't want to show it. There is a column in that space. That, and this comes out like that. And you're here. There's this big hole on the other side. This traje down the other side. And here is poor old Pere, this dumpy plan. So you, I'm really, I, I, I think you can look at that and feel excited. And you can look at that and say, Christmas, what's it doing? You know, boy, is that dull. And especially when you get in the upper floors, it's really great to see what the Plan Lieb can do, what, what a labyrinth he can make. Venturi picked all this up from him later. And there's a lot. So you come up the stairs, you come up here, and you look around and you're looking for your bedroom. You open this one, you say, pardon, madame, you close the door, you come around through here. And then way up above, here, and I should have shown you, it's the only thing that shows in the facade, is the bathtub of that, um, of that room up there at the top. See it up there? There's the bathtub, it shows you that. The Germans once referred to one of his works as La Cochonnerie de Paris, the piggery of Paris. Well, And on the other side, it just dances out into space. Now, all this comes together, of course, in the Villa Savoie, where you get the perfect, you get the square and the circle, you get the drawing, you get all we talked about, and you get the whole thing thinned out, like the surface of the ground at her side, we talked about. Now he's able to make it a building, a typical French building, dematerialized to drawing. And you come in from Paris, and it's like a Cubist painting in an impressionist landscape. It was. But thing of grass, uh, distant trees. You come in, scattering gravel. Imagine driving in there. Oh yeah, come around it on the other side like that. Come in under it. We would get out of the car probably. And then above it, and this photograph actually was taken by Richard Meyer who has a right to do so. He's worked on Corbusier so long in his own work. Nevertheless, you see it there. The columns underneath, the stretch. And in plan, you can see the whole thing. There's all that stuff I showed you at the Maison La Roche, all those shapes in that early house. Now they're all squeezed into the square. That's right. So you read it all against the frame, but that frame is penetrated every way by the window at human scale, so you always get the horizon, like that. And you see, so you come in there, and you come, here's the hall, and there's a circular staircase here, and a ramp going up, and you look down into that. It's like looking into a brain, as you see, and you come back this way, comes up here, then you can go out in the terrace, then you can go in the living room. In the living room, you look back on this, and here this all opens, and here you go up, and come up finally to the Brie Soleil, I mean up to the uh, sun solarium up in there, at the top, a really nice square hole. You'll see how Venturi adapts all that, and his, his, uh, his program of 1939. It's really great. Here he comes. The master leaves his hat there. Often he leaves his glasses. That's wrong, glasses. Then he comes in there. It is pumping of that staircase. There is the ramp. You look up the ramp. You see, it's like looking into a, 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 a text by Levi Strauss when he writes later about a, when he traces an anthropological myth. It's like going through the, 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 the it, it, like going through a brain. Going through the interwoven qualities of a brain. That's what that's like there, walking through it. You used to be able to walk right through, it was wonderful. You put down a couple of francs at the gatehouse, and you walk through, and they let you alone. You walk one, it's wonderful. I don't know if it's still possible. And then you go up farther, you're up the second floor, you see, and you go into the living room, tiny little, funny little fireplace again. Look to the left, and there it's going up. Get out there. Uh, get out there and it's uh, the horizon is all out there and you're up above it like that. You get out beyond here and you see that's where the, sorry, sorry. 
That's where it stretches. What's really important is that ramp. You get up the ramp, and you're on that ship. See, there it is. La chute tout, c'est le jeu, salon correct, magnifique, des formes sur la lumière. And you go up it, but then what happens? Then it's all rusted. Nature has invaded. Wolves run in the streets of the city. It's World War II, just like the Bauhaus. And it's wonderful that it's all restored by Malraux, who was the great French uh, minister of uh, culture under de Gaulle, who loves Corbusier. He spoke a great French uh, sermon at his uh, funeral, talks about the cinders, the, the dust of Chandigarh and the, and, the, and the son of the Acropolis or whatever. But there it is. And then Corbusier never again will do it so that anybody can do this to it. You'll see what his work after World War II is like. Thanks. Talk about that next time.